Um, thank you, everybody, and welcome to the session, the dialogue on gender equity challenges and opportunities across the power sector. I know the rest of the world out there is probably listening to that title and thinking to themselves, how many of you are thinking that? Raise your hands. Okay, good. I'm glad to see nobody would admit it, even though I know half of you are. <laughs> Here's the deal. For the next, uh, what is this session? It's, okay, four hours and 20 minutes. For the next four hours and 20 minutes, <laughs> we are going to have a discussion that I think you're going to find uh, exceptionally interesting. Why? Because, in fact, you may have heard this already, but let me share it with you. 51%, 51%, that's one percentage point more than half of the population of the entire planet are women. And in our workforce in many sectors, the power sector being one of them, the participation rate on the part of women is as little as 5%. So how do we write that wrong? How do we make that round whole square? How do we identify the challenges? How do we understand what is effective, efficient, profitable, best, better? And then how do we make that happen in a relatively short period of time, like in the next 20 minutes? or maybe in the next generation. But something in between would be my preference. So, with that, I would like to introduce a few of the people on our panel. In fact, you know what? Let me introduce all of them. Dr. Shalini Sarin, who's with us today. I'm, I'm sorry, some of these people I'm meeting for the very first time, so I'm, I'm sort of faking it as we go, as we go uh, through it, so you'll have to Bear with me. I won't read her entire CV here, but I will point out that uh, she has a, a, a range of experiences, um, from the chief people officer to the head of corporate social responsibility to a, being a business leader for the base of the pyramid solar lighting business for social impact. Profit with purpose is her mantra and belief, and she has worked across India, Europe, and the US. I heard actually that she's now based in the Netherlands, or I guess Amsterdam. That's in the Netherlands, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So, um, and we are exceptionally honored to have you with us today. I'm sorry, I'm looking. There we go. Okay, I found it. Board Chair of Signify Foundation Netherlands and International Solar Alliance Global Task Force for Foundations, UN Independent Director Lind, India, Automotive Axles LTD, and Meritor HVS, India Strategic Advisor, Human Resources, BOP, and CSR. Okay, good, I like it. We will turn the page to the next person. I guess this is the reason they give you a podium. Kathleen O'Dell is Certified Renewable Energy Professional and Carbon Reduction Manager. I've known Catherine for a while, but I've never read this of her, so I'm learning as you are. She's a principal at Deloitte Consulting Energy and Sustainability Practice, and she has 20 years of global experience in the gender energy nexus, energy sector reform, and private sector development in emerging markets. Kathleen is the author and presenter on various topics, including smart cities, energy efficiency, energy analytics, and the gender energy nexus at universities and conferences, including the World Energy Engineering Conference, International Green Building Conference, the Energy Efficient Buildings Workshop, and Economic Zones, Smart Cities, and New Urban Environments. She's recently been a panelist on the Smart Cities Roundtable at the 2017 Global Public Sector Annual Summit. We're very, very happy to have you with us, Kathleen. Thank you for joining us. Next on our list that I can, okay, Ashu, you mind if I go with you next? All right. Um, Dr. Ashu Verma is 
2001 BTEC graduate in electrical engineering from National Institute of Technology in Hamirpur. Um, she pursued her master's in power systems from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, 2002, and completed her PhD in transmission network expansion planning from electrical engineering department at IIT, Delhi, 2010. She is cur currently associate assistant professor, associate professor uh, at um, IIT, and we are very, very ecstatic to have her. Boy, oh boy, you have a long list of accomplishments and um, publications. Okay, I have a bunch of things on here now. I have them on my reading list. Thank you for being with us. Um, a good uh, friend and colleague of mine, Marcus Wipier. Marcus Wipier holds a degree as an economist from the University of Bonn in Germany. He's been working in various industrial and development cooperation projects in Eastern Europe, in Central Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. He joined GI SED in 2003 as a regional manager in the Asia Pacific Department, responsible for energy and environment projects. From 2005 to 2010, he was seconded to India for the implementation of the National CFC Consumption Phase-Out Plan and the National CTC Phase-Out Plan under the Montreal Protocol on substances that delete the ozone layer. From 12 to 15, he headed the support office of the Indo-German Energy Forum in New Delhi. He's today the Deputy Director of the Indo-German Energy Program and heads the iGen Green Energy Corridor Project on large-scale grid integration of renewable energy. And we're also happy to say he is one of our very dear friends and partners in the implementation of this particular conference these last couple days. Very happy to have you with us. Now, finally, but certainly not least, we have uh, Debolina um, Chakravarti. And Debrilina has around 13 years of overall experience um, gr grounding in technology and software, followed by five years of search with Spencer Stewart. And in her current role, she is a research director in India and is a member of the technology, business, and professional services and legal practices. From a geographical standpoint, she focuses on companies operating in India and in the broader Asia Pacific region. Prior to this, she's eight years of experience in ID product develop, IT product development and management of turnkey implementation projects across Europe, North America, and India, with more than six years of that in the UK. She's led the development team of 12 to, uh, in V-Life, uh, a Cigna health insurance company, building a ledge, led, leading edge health and targeted risk assessment IT solution on Java and net platforms. She also has a boatload of experience across the sector doing a lot of things that are incredibly relevant to what we're going to talk about today. So, Debolina, we look forward to those contributions and we are grateful for your participation. All right, enough of me. We are going to get started here. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a leading question or two. I'm going to ask the panelists to comment on the question, in other words, a specific question for a specific person, and then their response is going to be sort of cattle feed for the rest of us to sort of chew on and come back with some questions and some comments, and I'm hoping that folks here will see their way towards challenging some of the assumptions or some of the um, arguments made by our panel members. These are experts. These are people steeped in their fields. These are people who bring with them a whole lot of ideas and creative thinking. But in all of those circumstances, when we are faced with people who know so much about so many different things, it's our responsibility to step in and question those things, to ask more questions to keep them thinking and to keep ourselves thinking. So that's what I'd like to use this session for for the next, we're now down to three hours and 50 minutes. Okay? So does anybody have any questions or comments before we get started? Okay, I'm going to take that as a yes. We're going forward here. I'm going to start off with um, Shalini Saran and I'm going to pose a question, and you're going to give it your best, all right? So, <laughs> Shalini, coming to you from Amsterdam, given the enormous amount of experience that you've had with key leadership positions, what, in your view, are the two key policy and regulatory interventions that could help increase women participation in the energy sector? Let me start from the problem statement and then give the sol solutions. 
I think one of the big, biggest problems that we've not been able to transition to clean energy as fast as we want to be is because we do not have enough diversity in the energy sector per se. And, and women are, as you said, 51% on this planet, but also a key consumer of energy as well. So with our customers being, uh, you know, women, we cannot really cater to them by just having men on the other side providing solutions to it. And whenever we have gone out to hire women from this space, we've not had enough pool of technical women from the STEM side uh, to be able to hire. So I think the first thing that we need to be able to do is to, uh, like I said, we just talked about cultivate more tomatoes. So we need to be able to have more women uh, from school to college and then at the entry level because unless I have that pool, and, and I was speaking to one of the millennials during lunch, and she said, you know, even in schools, we, uh, we are, you know, the girls are, are doing the softer uh, skills part or, or playing with dolls or taking other elective courses, and the guys are doing mathematics or the uh, mechanical stuff. We do not have enough resource pool for uh, hiring in the operational uh, roles uh, for utilities, like, for example. So we need to be able to cultivate them so that companies like ours can hire them and utilities can, of course, uh, utilize this talent. So that's solution number one. And after you hire, I think it's extremely important that we provide them the requisite training, visibility, uh, and, and you know, while you are, I'm philosophically against the quota system, but it's extremely important to have a number or a target for the CEOs to go and find those resources so that we are equitable, uh, if not equal, because in order to, be, to have equality, we need to have equity uh, before we reach equality. So, and, and, and of course, uh, like uh, World Bank has come out with, you know, three buckets of improving gender inclusion and the buckets they describe are one, we must provide the right infrastructure. So infrastructure means safety, uh, mobility, uh, security, uh, sometimes even toilets are not found in many of the offices uh, across India uh, for women. And, and, and crashes and whatever else, and policies to provide the flexibility to women. So that's the first category of the bucket. The second category is the skills, the education, the financial inclusion and empowerment to be able to uh, provide them the requisite ammunition. And the third and the most important is to have women in the position of influence, whether it's politics, whether bureaucracy, or boards or leadership positions. Unless you have enough women in positions of influence, you are not going to make the needle move. So this is a nutshell summary, and, and maybe I can share more as we discuss. Thank you very much. Um, you touched on a lot of points there, and a lot of really good points there that I think we want to explore a little bit further, and we will do that as we go on. I, I want to kind of point out some of the underlying assumptions here in this discussion. Um, in India specifically, but around the world, of course, the energy sector remains one of the, the most gender imbalanced sectors. Um, and participation of women in the power sector is, is, is highly skewed. Um, and I like to ask the question more so how, but in the beginning, why? Why is that skew out there in the workforce, in the power sector? And once we see women are entering the power sector, what we find out is that they rarely attain positions of leadership. Why is that the case? Because I think if we're willing to examine those parts, we might be able to get to a solution set, or at least the beginnings of one, that allow us to discuss that. And I'm wondering if I can um, ask uh, Kathleen to 
touch on that a little bit. I know your experiences are very broad around the world in a variety of countries and cultures, um, but I, I venture to guess and tell me if I'm wrong that you have seen this over and over again regardless of where you find yourself. Yeah, I would think, I'd say there are several trends that we do see in a lot of places. You don't want to make it a catch-all. Of course, every environment has its own uh, specific situation, but so Shalini hit on some very important points that we have seen time and time again. I think, you know, when you look at it, the, if you look at it specifically from the talent side, then you want to look at recruitment, you want to look at retention and you want to look at advancement. So breaking it into those buckets, you, you start to see several of the things already mentioned. So on the recruitment side, certainly the pipeline is the starting point. This, in many countries, this can be a major issue around the degrees, the programs that young women um, choose to go into. But not in all cases. There are countries in the world where the engineering programs are, have you know, equal 50-50, and sometimes, in some cases, even more um, young women than young men. So looking at that pipeline is first and foremost. And how do you, in those countries where that is um, not happening, where it is skewed towards young men, then why is that? And creating programs that start all the way down to the elementary school level and, and onward um, that create some buzz and interest and uh, showing girls that this is an area that they can get into as well. So after you're looking at, at the recruitment side, then on the retention side, it's really, um, I think, some of the key factors you talk about. So if if there, in some countries, 50% of the engineers um, graduating are women, why is the workforce 19% in some of those countries, the same countries? So clearly the retention issue is um, a huge factor. And I think companies need to be looking at policies that create um, level playing fields for both women and men around you know, the fundamental issues of care and family that all of us face. Because when you don't provide that for men and women in an equal way in your workplace, then you're gonna lose women. Because the burden more often than not um, rests in women on all of the issues, um, whether it's, um, you know, from a more traditional, tr traditional roles for family uh, in, in family. On the advancement side, I think Shalini also hit on that, which is being intentional and deliberate about how you select candidates for training programs, about how you provide um, individuals with very high profile opportunities within companies. And those things are so important when it we often find that it just defaults, oh, well, there just aren't women that are interested in that. There just aren't women that want to go to the field. There just aren't women that want to travel for their job. And those things simply aren't always true, and we need to be able to make, be more deliberate in looking for opportunities that can help women advance in those ways. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, you, make a, you make a bunch of good points, of course, but I did want to kind of challenge you on, on one thing. There, there is this sort of perception in the workplace, uh, specifically amongst women in the power sector, where we talk about, you know, the dominance of field-based activities and that um, women are not always able to separate themselves from family and therefore don't end up in those kind of opportunities where they build sort of like what we call street cred, you know, oh, you've been out there for five years in the field, you've been operating a power plant, you've been looking at the things on the ground, um, and, and very often women get marginalized because they don't have those opportunities, sometimes self-imposed. The other piece is, is that schools, perhaps not just here, but all over the world are not encouraging women to get into the science and technology, the STEM field fields, but it's not always at the university level. It happens prior to that, right? I'm, professor, I'm sure you've seen this, you get, competent, really, really bright, hardworking young women, but they haven't been prepared. They haven't been sort of given the opportunities when they're in secondary school to sort of think about how they develop those skills that are essential to be accelerated, to be successful when they get there. Um, and I'm wondering if you might consider sort of talking about that, how you come out of one of the pristine uh, science technology schools in the country, probably in the world. Uh, you've seen a lot of that issue 
people that are well prepared, those that aren't, those that you would like to see succeed, uh, but they just don't have all the tools. How do we make sure they get those tools? So, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to emphasize again on a few of the points which were raised by Shalini Ji and of course Kathleen also. One thing which is very important or we have to understand is that it is not one institute, one organization, or one place we can change it. It is, uh, if we really want to make women enter into science and technology engineering streams, it has to be a really social, completely so societal reform, right? So we have to start telling our girls from the very beginning that they, they should, you know, take up these kind of trades. And second is, uh, it's also important to understand the interactions that some of the fields you'll find a lot of women, uh, even into engineering or humanities or biotechnology, but some of the areas you'll find less in number. So the reasons behind them. Uh, and what I feel is that at senior secondary, uh, whatever is my experience, uh, whatever opportunities are given in the school, they are equal to men and women. It, quite a bit, you know, organically how we treat those opportunities, that is also very important. And uh, even looking at institutes, uh, wherever I worked or wherever I studied, I never felt that the opportunities were less for women or they were not given to the women. So the point is that that means there is a complete, uh, you know, the way we are brought up and the way, uh, you know, we want to pursue things uh, is, uh, it should also be seen. Of course, there are other policy mechanisms which will help, maybe specifically private sector and even government sectors that, of course, there are some few things which fundamentally happens to women and then at that time, you lose a little connect with your work and then coming back uh, to that work, for example, going for motherhood and all. So those type of hurdles are there. So maybe more uh, uh, like, uh, emphasis uh, at that time or uh, more uh, organizations can provide better, not opportunity, but better facilities, which also I feel that, you know, a lot of things are there. So if I share you with my personal experience, I started my, I started my career through field job, okay? So I joined in a power sector and I worked there for two years. When we joined, it was a government uh, hydroelectric power project. We all GETs, uh, the we were 20 out of three women, we were sent to the field. So the policy was good. Organization treated us, of course, equal. We stayed there quite happy during the commissioning stage. But when the plant came into operation and maintenance, again, we found, you know, difficulties. Uh, so maybe the site was not ready to, you know, take uh, women in. And then there were few things which were, you know, really, gender specific, like operational. They were having shifts, then either maintenance, so, and so after a year or half, all three of us landed into the office jobs. So, so, so I would rather say that it's nobody's stopping, but overall it's a societal reform which would be really helping. And looking at the interactions, why a few of the trades uh, people prefer and a woman prefer and a few of the trades there. Thank you. Hey, Professor, thank you very much. There's a lot of insight there, but it's based on a lot of experience. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a ring of truth to it that m pushes us to consider these kind of new in options. I, I want to just sort of press you on one, two pieces. Uh, one is this concept that we wait until the time is right. I'm not so sure everybody would necessarily agree to that, rather than taking the other option, which is push it even when the time isn't right. I'm curious about if that's uh, an option. The second thing I would sort of, as I've heard, actually all three of you sort of marginally brush past, is that there's some role in all of this for almost um, quota systems. And I wonder if society is willing to advocate for that sort of way forward. And so with that, let me go to our next panelist, my good friend Marcus. Um, the reason I go to Marcus now is, and it's not just because he's next in line, but it's because, and it's not just because he's the only man on the panel. It is because Marcus has a wealth of experience working in a variety of countries and a variety of circumstances, and he works for, like I do, one of the uh, development organizations, and comes from a country that invests its scarce foreign aid 
dollars or, or euros into these sorts of ventures. And so I think that perspective would be a good one to have. What do you think about this concept of quotas? Is that the only way to get to a place where there are more women studying science and technology? Is that the only place to get women more involved in the university setting where they can gain these skills and experience? Is that the only way to get women into the workplace where they can not only gain the experience that helps them develop into leaders, but are we also meant to give quotas to the leaders themselves in these major operations like power systems, corporations, and utilities, et cetera, et cetera? Um, how does the development community see that uh, as a possibility? Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, before going a little bit into the broader details, I just answer your question. Um, personally, I believe quotas are the last resort. Uh, they may be necessary if nothing else works, but there are risks with quotas. So, for example, if you um, admit uh, more women into your workforce and into leadership positions on the merit of quotas, you will hear a lot of things in the corridors uh, whispered, uh, oh, she got the job just because of the quota. And uh, this is, I think, the worst what could happen uh, also to that particular woman uh, who got that position, right? Because she will not even have a chance to prove that she really has the skills and, and the ambition, et cetera, because she's just a quota woman, right? And this is the most negative thing, how you can actually get uh, to that person, right? So I think quota might be necessary. Uh, if nothing else works, then of course something has to be done. Uh, but uh, I will come back to this point a little later. There might be some other uh, less harsh methods to it also. Um, as you said, yeah, we are working for the development cooperation organizations, and uh, that means we cannot just do what we want. So we are answerable, and uh, in particular, we are answerable um, to the uh, Development Assistance Committee of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, and uh, the uh, DAC of the OECD has uh, also a systematic uh, way of uh, monitoring how we do our business. It's not only gender, there are other safeguards as well, uh, but in particular uh, with the gender also our things have changed a lot uh, after 2015 uh, because of the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs and uh, the uh, Development Assistance Committee also has revised their, um, let's say, uh, measures and the minimum requirements to, to categorize those projects. And for us, that's of course important because we want our projects to be uh, counted as uh, official development assistance, but that's only possible if we meet those requirements and we have to do the monitoring. So how does the OECD DAC uh, does it? They have actually three categories of projects. Um, uh, if you have a gender indicator of uh, two, uh, then uh, this project is actually dedicated to tackle and address issues related to gender. So it will be a full-fledged project to, let's say, uh, strengthen women in the rural area uh, by uh, yeah, just at, um, bringing all your measures, all your activities to do only that. Then there is gender indicator number one. That's a project which has uh, perhaps another main objective, but you still have an indicator where you specifically focus on an aspect where you improve things which, which are, let's say, uh, in the gender bias dimension. Uh, for example, uh, you, you, you really encourage um, in a specific measure women to, to, to address or, or to, to, to be strengthened in that particular situation. And then there is gender zero, um, and that's not the default option anymore. I would say it was before, but it's no longer. Uh, so that means it's actually, this project doesn't have an activity specifically uh, targeted for gender issues. Nevertheless, uh, the new situation is that each project, what we undertake, has to uh, 
go through a thorough analysis. So we have to bring a gender analysis for each and every project, uh, what we intend to do. And we have to bring the proof uh, that even if we think that this project is having the indicator of GG0, uh, is doing no harm, meaning doesn't change anything what is uh, already in place uh, to the worst. And uh, if you can't bring that proof, you are no longer allowed to put your project in any of the categories one, two, three, uh, zero, one, two. Uh, in this case, you are just uh, have to leave it blank. And that has also some consequences. It means actually you haven't done your homework or you're not able to do it. Okay, coming back to that. Um, I would say those GG2 projects, they are fairly straightforward. Uh, in particular, when it comes to rural areas, it is now well known that it is very important to, to particular strengthen women in rural areas because they actually are, can, act, can make a lot of difference and also you have the largest gaps here. You have uh, women who have no access to the relevant information, they don't have, information, uh, they don't have finances, or they, they don't have actually anything at hand to change the situation uh, due to many uh, issues. I can't elaborate in too much into that now. Uh, but this is straightforward. It is known and you can design a project uh, quite well for that and measure it also. But when it comes to uh, the GG1 or even the GG0 projects, it becomes very difficult. I just experienced that recently myself when I was designing a new project. And uh, then uh, we thought also, what difference can we still make? Before the revision of the uh, DAC indicators, uh, I would say most of our projects we do here in Delhi, working with the central governments and uh, working on policy issues and, and those things, we just automatically said, oh, it's, this is gender zero by default. It doesn't have any gender component, that's it. And we don't look into it any further and we don't spend time on it. You can't do that anymore. Now you have to formulate some specific measures and you have to really uh, think hard. And we did that a little bit and uh, there is actually a lot what you still can do. Uh, for example, this, I think this event even also is already a sign that things have changed because in the previous conference we didn't have it, right? And um, what can be done is that really one looks into the panels. Can we have at least one or two women on each panel? Make it a rule. Uh, when we specifically have call for papers for the conference like this, make it a rule, say we want specifically contributions from women and uh, have a roster of, of women uh, who are experts in their field and whenever you conduct a workshop, a conference like this, uh, go through that roster and pick those particular women. So make sure that the visibility of women as experts in their field uh, is there. I think that is uh, an excellent measure to, to support women in, in this field and also encourage others to do the same. And I would really prefer this before we really have to go to the extreme of quotas for the very reason which I mentioned in the beginning. Thank, thanks, Marcus. Thanks very much. Very complete answer with a, lo with a lot of detail, I think, building on what our other panelists have said uh, thus far. I'm going to, I, I, I want to uh, entertain uh, some thoughts from Debelina and then we'll come to the audience. So if you could please have a few questions and then we'll identify folks around the room. But before we get there, I, I don't want you to go back to this issue on quotas, Debelina, but I, I do want, I know you've done a lot of work with Spencer Stewart. Um, I know a lot of it's been on human resource engagement at the leadership level. Um, I know you've really looked at the hiring considerations that happen for hiring C plus level uh, executives. Uh, and I I'm interested to know, I think the audience is interested to know, how do these women fare? What do you see as sort of the consistent pieces of their makeup? And, and I guess the bigger question for me is, what's the risk of not focusing on this? From an HR point of view, what is the risk? If we don't have this, as Marcus points out, we don't have this conversation. If we're not moving this issue forward, um, I think as Kathleen kind of pointed out that uh, we need to be thinking about it at every kind of step of the way, what are the risks of not doing this? If we just went back to business as usual tomorrow and said, you know, it's easier the other way. No, absolutely. So um, if you think about what 
um, you know, senior leaders need to do, right? Um, you know, when we look at hiring senior leaders across different um, functions, different industries, not just in the industry sector that we are talking about here, but across every single industry. Um, people are looking at well-rounded leaders. So uh, people who bring a good balance of people leadership, technical abilities, um, you know, ability to adjust to different cultures, um, and the ability to transition into larger roles in the future. Um, and if we break it down, each, each of these four qualities, um, if we don't have gender diversity in the companies, in the leaderships, uh, leadership positions, um, the, the balance of the companies kind of break down. Um, you know, you will not have the, uh, the cultural agility that you will have if you have that balance. You will not have the right kind of technical balance that you will have if you have the kind of gender ratio that should be there. I think um, what is also very important to note here, I think, um, um, you know, a lot of it has also been covered by my panelists here, um, is that, um, you know, the, the ecosystem, the environment that we create for women, um, you know, whether it is within the company, within the family, within the broader society, um, it is very important for them to take the right decisions. Um, and, um, you know, it is, it is not just, um, you know, for the company to decide that, okay, you know, I have a senior leadership of 10 people, I would like two women over there. Um, the ability to get the two women over there and make sure that they are successful there, I think that is the most critical element. And also from, um, from the women's angle, right? So from, from a leadership standpoint, it is also very important for us to be able to take the risks when required. Um, you know, um, there, there are times when we feel that we are not 100% ready. Um, we, we feel that, um, um, you know, this is not the right life stage for us to move. Um, but, um, you know, it is, the onus is also on us to ensure that we are taking the right kind of opportunities that are given to us. Um, you know, as, as Ashu rightly pointed out, um, quite often the opportunities are there. Um, you know, we also need to go and grab it. So um, a combination of, um, you know, how the companies are thinking about uh, gender diversity, um, how um, people themselves are thinking about it, men or women, as well as the broader society, I think it's very important to uh, make people successful. Um, what I would um, probably end with is that over the course of the last uh, seven years that I've been with Spencer Stewart, I've observed that majority of the companies, especially on the uh, multinational side, on um, you know, the larger Indian conglomerate side, um, are now making a conscious effort to deal with this problem. Um, you know, there are multiple statistics to prove that we are not there yet, um, but I think there is a lot of steps that are being taken to um, you know, ensure that that correction is made. Thank you. Thank you, Devalina. I appreciate those comments. Um, I want to dig down into a little bit about what you said there, but I want to relate it to a specific uh, piece, and I think it's time for us to open up to the audience. We don't have a whole lot more time here, two hours and 40 minutes. So um, we'll just uh, get some other folks to uh, chime in. If you have questions, please let us know. But one of the things I'd like Debolina to consider specifically, because I know she's been involved in this discussion uh, in a very, very profound way, and that is how do we begin in a very systematic manner to deal with the issues of unconscious bias in the workplace, where sometimes women's progress is impeded, not just in the energy sector, of course, but in all sectors, in government, in the public, private sector. Um, I, my personal feeling, if, I, if you don't mind me expressing it, is just there's, there's never a right time uh, to consider and work for the issues we refer to as social justice. And therefore, it is every time. It is always. Um, it's today and it's tomorrow. And it's everywhere. It is both spatial and temporal. Uh, social justice issues are about the world we leave to our children. Uh, it is about the world that we exist in ourselves, one that 
treats everybody fairly and equally. I would guess that um, everybody can sort of generically uh, support that. It's, it's pretty uh, well-founded and probably pretty um, common to think that, but it's not necessarily easy to implement in a social environment where people are working together every day, where there are decisions to be made, there are resources to be expended, uh, there are challenges confronted that have to be overcome. In the normal dynamic of the day, whether it's in the workplace or in our families, but certainly in the workplace, uh, it is a big issue about how we start to uh, identify uh, and then treat and then deal with these unconscious pieces of bias that we're all confronted by of which we are both receivers and perpetrators. And, uh, and so I, I'd like us to think about that as you're asking some of your questions up here to the panel, and then I'd like the panel to be thinking about that as you're responding, if we can keep that as a kind of cross-cutting theme. Thank you. How about questions from the audience? I know that this discussion has been incredibly uh, robust already. We covered a lot of space, but I'm sure there are pieces of it that you'd like to know more about or people you'd like to ask questions of. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. You're all being shy right now, and I don't like shy people. Yes, please, right here in the front, sir. Good evening, Vibhu Kaushik from Southern California, Edison. Thank you for the panel, Michael, and all the, all the participants. Um, one of the points I want to make before I ask the question is, um, we talked about the access to opportunities, access to support, having the system in, in place for women to have opp opportunities. Um, it goes it goes above and beyond, and it's. I want to clarify for the way I'm thinking. It's not a problem in developing countries, not a problem of India. It is a global problem. So, uh, last year, New York Times published an article in April where they concluded that the number of men with the name John exceeds the total number of women CEOs in Fortune 500. Kathleen is uh, nodding, so you must have read that article. Um, in the current uh, U.S. political system, there are more Republican senators with name John than total number of women. That there are more uh, Democratic governors with name John than number of women. Not just John. If I add Mike to it, it goes way above. <laughs> and Paul, it goes <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> so not to pick on you. So I think, sorry, that was not the point. <laughs> so the, how do we change this, these systematic biases? I think. Uh, we don't want the quotas, we want leadership. We want leadership is about doing the right thing before it becomes the obvious and the popular thing to do. So what are some of the examples that maybe um, some of you in panelists have seen that your organizations that you work for or have worked for, where you see leadership has taken something that would move that, um, these perceptions, these biases towards that, that direction. And I'll kick off with an example um, the one area where I've seen is the, the place I work, men are encouraged to take bonding leaves, paternity leaves, when the, with as much as women, and more and more men are taking um, that, that initial period of the time before your child is one or two year old, taking, sharing that time and taking it off, and that's just making that happen somehow changes the mentality on, on uh, the need for that and any sort of biases towards that it's only a woman thing or when they come back to workforce, they don't have the same thing. So other examples if... Great, thank you very much for that question, John. Um, <laughs> he's my dude, that guy's Southern California Edison. I'm from Southern California. Um, I, so you, you embedded a lot in that, and so I want to kind of unpack it a little bit, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, Salini, if we could start with you, because I think your experiences on the European, Indian, sort of having two feet in both sides, you said you, trans, you transit back and forth from the two. You probably have some comparison and contrast and some universal pieces that, regardless of where you are, are true. So... I'm not going to compare and contrast India and Europe for now, but I want to be able to share one experience which helped, uh, which helped our organization. And, and again, this is in the energy space. So um, as an HR person, you know, I was tracking the numbers and reporting the numbers. And I think a lot depends on the leadership uh, and their belief in really uh, ha having a tick in the box or really hiring women to create the impact, like I said, that our customer base over there is not all men. 
and therefore we must have more women in the organization. But what we were doing or what inadvertently was happening was we were getting a lot of women in HR. We were getting a lot of women in marketing or marketing communication. Uh, we even got women in finance. So as we were calling it enabling functions or support functions and whatever you may call it. However, when we hired a woman as a PNL leader to head one of, the, one of the energy verticals in industrial automation, that's when the needle started to move. And that's where we saw the dynamics in the room started to change. Because in the early days, we had all those men coterie trying to be one to be able to pull her down every time the numbers were better. But uh, like uh, Debulina mentioned, that it is not just getting those women there. It is supporting them and helping them to succeed, which is a bigger challenge. So I think these are the two things that I wanted to share from my experience, which really moved the needle for us. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to go to another question in the audience. Kathleen, I'll come back to you, I promise. Um, but I know, yeah, there's, there's way too much to cover here in a short period of time, but we'll try to get to as much as we can. How about the next question? Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, my name is Nair Tara. I currently work with APCO Worldwide, which is a consulting and public affairs firm. Um, in the past, I've worked with Tata Power Delhi, which is a distribution utility in the legal field, and I've also worked in electricity litigation subsequently. Um, I'm going to limit my comment um, to the period of time that I spent with Tata Power, uh, understandably, considering that it is you know, a power utility, the workforce was overwhelmingly male. And I often found myself um, in a room full of men, usually the youngest person in the room. It was an entry-level job. But what I found really helped, and I'm not suggesting a system of quotas, but something like a buddy system. Being the only woman in a room full of men can be terrifying, you know? And being in the field and being a woman by yourself can also be scary. And it's very difficult to speak to anyone else about that shared experience um, in any field, actually. But in the power structure, or sorry, in the power field, it's even more so because you're always assumed to have less technical skill. Your voice is often not amplified. So again, what do you say to a system of maybe not quotas, but if you're hiring one woman in a team, maybe make it a point to have another or hire her under a female leader? just some way to make it more accessible and enable that, that voice to be heard. Um, this is directed at anyone who would wish to answer it. If you don't mind, I'm going to call on Kathleen, because I think, again, you, you come from a variety of backgrounds um, in your work experience. I think you can find relevant examples, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that <clears throat> many have had the same experience. And actually, the research shows that when you really move the needle is not when you have one woman on the team, but when you have two. Because it's, it's interesting, because otherwise it's seen as sort of that ad hoc, kind of one-off exception, um, rather than uh, a trend. Um, so I totally agree on that. I think also, what I heard, though, in, in your speaking is um, a broader issue around sponsorship or support within the organization, whether it's male or female. Um, I think that um, oftentimes having a very deliberate um, support network um, around individuals, whether they're women or it could be other groups that need additional support to be kind of pushed out in front, I think uh, can make a, just an overwhelming difference in career trajectory. Um, I also really liked what Marcus said about n not having a quota necessarily because that can really disempower individuals when selected under that kind of a scheme. But again, I keep using this word, but sort of this deliberate or intentional 
perspective around the way we look at our pool of candidates and whether it's on panels or, or papers, but even what you said about having kind of a list of your experts that you're going out and very specifically targeting getting diversity. And I think we can all do the same in a broader sense in the way we put our teams together, the way we um, put our departments together, our org charts, and all of that thinking is being a more deliberate about that. And I just wanted to say one last thing on your unconscious bias comment. Um, this is a universal issue, no question. Uh, at Deloitte, we have very recently um, embarked on a, a whole scale training internally around unconscious bias because <clears throat> of our own acknowledgement of how important it is to get that conversation out in front and have people engage in that and, and build that awareness um, across the board. So everybody goes through that training and I think that's just an entry point to opening up that conversation for people to start building awareness. Thanks Kathleen. Um, some very uh, powerful observations there. I want to just share, if I may, a couple of my own because it's an issue near and dear to my heart. I, uh, we had a uh, deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy here in Delhi for uh, three years. Um, many of you may remember her, Mary Kay. Uh, she was a brilliant woman who uh, did a lot of good work to foster uh, social justice issues for everybody. Uh, it wasn't, she wasn't a woman-man thing, but she tells some very interesting stories about her early career as a diplomat uh, and sitting in some of the very top-level uh, negotiations and work areas that she was brought into uh, as an entry level and then a mid-level. One of the incidents she kind of recalled was this time uh, in very, very high-level negotiations, and I won't share the details because then I have to kill all of you, but it is uh, somewhere in the world where she was sitting around a table negotiating nuclear agreements and um, one of the managers in the room, American, sitting with her, uh, when they were introducing people around the table, they asked each person to introduce themselves. When they got to Mary Kay, who was sitting in the second tier, who she had done all the work. She did all the paperwork. She did all the preparation, the whole bit. She actually did all the analysis on the technical issues. Uh, but when it came around, the boss had stopped and said, and that's Mary Kay, and if you want some really good home-baked cookies, you should stop her at the end of the thing. I'm sure she'll be happy to help. Mary Kay talks about that issue with a lump in her throat and thinks back on it as a time when she had to bite her lip. This was a U.S. ambassador sitting at the head of the table whom she could not call out on that. But what she spoke to about to, to me, and what I take home from that is that this social justice issue, the unconscious bias piece, uh, the looking for opportunities to make sure that our hiring pools are broader and deeper, uh, the opportunities to look at skill sets that are very inclusive um, and they're not exclusive, um, even work assignments after people are brought into the workplace, it's a multi-tiered vision. In my view, I know in my own experiences, while I've tried to do this, sometimes I'm shadowed by one very specific thing, and that is the need to be perceived as being productive, achieving goals and outcomes. And sometimes when we are looking at a broader pool, we need to realize that productivity comes in a lot of different forms and that to understand the people above us and what their goals and motives are in terms of productivity may not accommodate everything we want to do in terms of our social justice agenda. But it is, in fact, more valuable than the simple economic productive agenda. And in order to do that and be, and be successful at it, we've got to convince people above us. I think it's in all of our job descriptions, if we're interested in these issues, to not only do it at our level with our peers and with our counterparts and with our underlings, but to make sure we're pushing this up to management, to people above us. I have tiers and tiers of people above me uh, all the way to you know where. And all of those people I have to make sure are involved in this conversation, not just me and them, not just me and my people that I work with. I'm very fortunate to work with an incredibly talented pool of folks but I know that in order to get real institutional change, I gotta make sure the people above me are also buying into this. And so I would encourage all of us to think about it in that way. It's not 
singular, it's not linear, it is multidimensional, and it must be thought of in that way. I, I want to talk, I want to ask the audience if there's another question out there, and I want to have somebody focus in on the preparatory pieces, the education. Yes, ma'am, in the green blouse, please. Good evening, everyone, uh, to the esteemed uh, panel of judges. A uh, very excellent point. My name is Sahana, and I'm working with Ernst & Young now, one of the big fours. And uh, when I entered into their electric mobility and renewable energy team, I was the first woman to enter their team, and this happened like just 10 months ago. So we can see that until then, they worked without a woman in the team. So what I'm saying is, even uh, if you see that there could be around 50 girls who passed out with me in the university, but then who would go back to work after the university level could be around 20 or 30, and that is the entry level statistics. But if you see the mid-management and the senior management levels, the number of women is even lesser. And I, I don't see any women boss above me in my organization in the vertical power and utilities that I am working in. And uh, let us be honest here, because when you are considering a woman for advancement or for retention in the company, there could be a phase where she's either getting married or she's going to bear children. And women have to bear children. There, there is no other way that men are going to do it. So when that is the case, we Not need yet. to we need to <laughs> we need to make it a point or we need to sensitize the organizations that just because she's going to be she's planning a family or she's going to be pregnant or she is pregnant, you cannot eliminate her from the list of giving her a promotion or advancing her in her career just by losing one member of the team or even, you know, she could work remotely for a few months and then get back onto your team and do the same job more efficiently. And let's face it, I have come from a family of where we have had grandmothers working in the fields, bearing children. My grandmother bore eight children, and then she worked in the fields right the second day after her delivery, or she worked in the field until her seventh month of pregnancy. If we are capable of doing physical work in times of pre pregnancy, the white collar jobs that we are doing now can be very easily handled even during that time. So why are we not thinking in that terms when we are thinking of women in terms of advancement and moving them ahead in the corporate ladder or business management? Thank you very much. I know you had a question in there somewhere. <laughs> but no, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, blaming you. I, your comment is um, poignant. And it's a piece that we don't discuss often enough. We all recognize how the whole continuing humanity happens, right? We all recognize the roles that we all play. Why are any parts of our population in some ways given demerits for fulfilling their important role? And certainly, why are they denied access to economic opportunities, to political stature, to social stature, and then, of course, to their own confident self-image that allows them to live out their dreams and ambitions? These, I think, are right at the crux of what you're talking about and the important elements that we have to use as the foundational arguments. Um, I would like to, however, we only have a few hours left, I would like to ask Professor Verma, from the education point of view, based on what our colleague here shared, how does academia see this point? I'm guessing, and I don't know, but I know from my own experiences in the US, academia is still, women are underrepresented in academia. If we drill down into the energy sector part of academia, those sciences that inform, and there's more than just simply the sciences, right? There's also the human resource elements, there's the administrative pieces of the power sector, there's the policy pieces of the power sector that all go into this. But in your particular area, your Ballywick, how could you address the issues this woman has highlighted, please? I personally think uh, that the issue what she raised is really very important because uh, yes, uh, there are a few things which will happen with women only and that's the time when most of us, you know, take a little back seat on our career. But uh, at the same time, in educational institutes, uh, things are, you know, still workable, manageable. So I may not be the very right person to answer this. Maybe somebody working with 
having a lot of experience, maybe Shalini ji, with private sector can answer. Only one point I would like to make is that, uh, see, everybody is understanding that uh, gender diversity or equity is an important issue. So the institutes also uh, to increase their intake more of women. So what thing which has been started and which really is looking uh, like it seems to uh, have some impact is that uh, after the entrance exam, some sort of uh, on-campus interaction with the participants who has cleared the exam has been started. So with that, we try to tell uh, the females who have cleared the exam that what are the avenues, opportunities, why they should come for electrical engineering versus civil engineering. So that have led to some increment uh, in you know women into these areas in last few years. So maybe when uh, companies hire, at that time also if you know that kind of, uh, sometimes we are not well informed about you know uh, the culture of that company or the how they can uh, have opportunities. So maybe that can help. So that is just an additional comment uh, other than what Fish. Yeah, Mike, if you may permit me. And, Please, uh, quickly. <laughs> So one, um, I think some of the thing, mommyhood is going to come to the woman. So the woman can, uh, the woman will get pregnant, but the man can rear the child. And I think so far we've only had policies around maternity leaves, whereas paternity leave is now catching up. So while the woman gives birth, but rearing is an equal job which can be shared by both. And We've seen the changes and the impact after that. The other thing is that when you, uh, uh, Dr. Ashu shared her experience, our structures and uh, systems were also made so traditionally uh, in the power sector that uh, it was ma made by men and therefore it was more amenable for them. So whether it is operational roles, whether it is going to sites, I think with technology, the advent of technology now, things should start changing. And that's a great opportunity for us to be able to balance the gender, to be able to get equal participation from men and women. So yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, you know, women were working in fields till the last day and then back again. Uh, but child rearing takes up more time than, you know, giving birth to the child. And I think that's where we see uh, things moving. You know, I, I, Shalini, thank you very much. I think you touched on a really important point there that we don't pay enough attention to. And, and I'll just comment quickly because we got to wrap this up. Um, we could go on for, for weeks. This concept that A, the institutions were established long before the current social norms caught up with them, and therefore they are mired in their past, and there's a need for not only reform and renewing the way we do business, but also the fact that we now know that the technology is available to completely refab the business environment and the structure of this industry and so many others, but certainly the power industry, um, is something I think we haven't paid enough attention to. We look at technologies for efficiency, we look at ten technologies for automation, we look at technologies for even replacing humans writ large, but we rarely look at technologies as a vehicle for integrating the full benefits of the workforce, the skilled workforce, into the work paradigm. And I think you might be touching on something there that I think is very real and very pertinent um, and can actually not just help gender balance, so to speak, or integrate women into the workforce, but really address social justice issues via, via technological improvements and, and aligning technologies with the needs in a more efficient way. I know that there are a couple other folks on the panel and many people in the audience that didn't get a chance to make uh, other comments, and I would love to have everybody make uh, more comments. Um, we will continue this discussion. I promise that if not today here, we will do it over cocktails and beers in the bars that you will find yourself in in the next couple of days, over dinner, uh, in the hallways and the coffee breaks, in the margins of the sessions that we're going to have, and the continued conversation happens afterwards in our own professional workplaces. That's where it's really important, in our own professional workplaces. But you are a lovely audience, and this conversation has been absolutely fabulous, and I am very honored to be a part of it. This is uh, Dr. Shalini Saran. Please give it up for her.
And this is our good friend from Deloitte, Kathleen O'Dell. Please tell her how much you love her. <laughs> Professor Ashu Verma um, from IIT is a wonderful contributor today and really moving the needle in terms of this issue and the power sector and making a better world for all of us. Tell her that. Tell her that. <laughs> My good friend Marcus, who comes from GIZ, uh, has been spending a lot of his life doing this because he believes in it, not just because it pays well because it doesn't really pay that well. <laughs> Tell him that you love him. And Deblina Chakravarti, who is with us today uh, because she brings a special perspective on the HR piece, how women make their way into the workplace, what the, le what the field needs to be to make sure that we get women into these places. No quotas? Fine. Let's prepare our workforce equally across the board so that our little girls and our little boys grow up to be women and men who are prepared not just to be competitive, but to contribute to society and make for a better world. Give it up for Debelina. I am absolutely grateful for all of you being here tonight. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Please come back tomorrow because there's a lot more to happen. And we wish you safe travels home and a thank you very much and a good night.